ahead and call to order the USD 49 Board of Education meeting for Monday, November 26, 2018. First thing on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Move to approve the agenda. Do you have a second? Second. It's been moved by Board Member Schwartz, second by Board Member O'Borney. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion passes 5 to 0. This time we um, will open for audience participation. Is there anyone that would like to address the board? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Next is the Best of the Best Awards. And this evening, um, our first one was uh, the teacher nomination was Matt Brooks and he was nominated by Abby Gillen. I know Matt can't be here tonight. Um, did Abby come? Okay, so um, I don't have the nomination in front of me, but congratulations to Matt. We'll make sure that he gets his thanks. Uh, our student um, nomination and a winner is Olivia Getz, and she was nominated by Michaela Gower. Michaela here? Okay, well, I have nominated Olivia because she pushes herself to be the best student in the classroom each and every day, and she comes with a willingness and hunger to learn. She exemplifies a growth mindset, which is something we've talked a lot about in fifth grade this year. Um, she exhibits this in writing each and every day. We've been working on narratives at the beginning of the year, and she wrote about her trip to the Kansas State Fair, and she comes in each day ready to improve her writing. Um, it's hard to do that every day and to ask that, and I've seen nothing but um, great qualities from her, and I know that she'll continue to push herself as she um, leaves me and heads towards the middle school next year. And um, it's just been an honor to be a part of her journey at Roosevelt, and I feel like she's very deserving of this award. Congratulations to both of our winners this month, and thank you to our sponsors, um, who include Gellas, Tiger Burgers, and Handyman for Hire. All right, next we'll move on to communications from other organizations, and I'm not sure if we have any. I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, school spotlights. We have two spotlights I'd like to end up sharing. Um, Hayes was named partner in STEM education and workforce training from the National League of Cities. Uh, they recently named Hayes as a partner in moving, improving and increasing STEM education and workforce training. Hayes was honored in part due to its cross-sector partnerships that have been forged and for future improvements with local business to enhance the workforce. Hayes will take part in this initiative through the connecting local bilingual services to STEM career support and expanding the program from 25 to 500 participants. Fort Hayes State University Science and Mathematics Education Institute and United School District's 489's Migrant Education Program in partnership with the City of Hayes and a host of civic partners commit to advancing the STEM and maker-centered learning of the city's migrant families by connecting bilingual services with STEM career pathway opportunities and expanding to the general population in 2019, growing from uh, 20 to 500 participants. Also, the Hope Pantry delivers Thanksgiving boxes. Really have, uh, that's, that's been a great project. We have uh, Hope Pantry uh, kicked off the holiday season. They spread holiday cheer to families in need throughout the district. Uh, family needs have increased during the school year and need for boxes to distribute to families uh, continue to grow. 72 boxes were packaged with non-perishable food items and sent home to families. The Hope Pantry will continue to provide assistance to families as long as resources allow. Those wishing to contribute to help families in need can donate non-perishable food items, hygiene products, and gently used other clothing that 
can be donated to Hope Pantry at the district office. Monetary donations will be used to purchase items for the holiday food and hygiene boxes. I said two, but there is a third. First Care Clinic uh, provides dental screenings for Hayes Middle School students. Thank you to First Care Clinic and Hayes for providing dental cleanings and exams for 123 Hayes Middle School students this month. The cleanings and exams were free for qualified students. First Care Clinic even treated the uh, Hayes Middle School staff to, uh, to cookies. Well, I just uh, want to thank the National League of Cities that Hayes is one of 50 communities nationwide to be recognized just for that. Very good. Yeah, I got a question about that. We're going from 25 to 500 students? Yeah. That's amazing. In Hayes. In Hayes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll let Shanna answer. Well, well no, I'm not doubting it. I just was a funny, amazing. Up to the nope. potential that it could impact by reaching out. It started with some partnership with the migrant and um, Fort Hayes with their uh, maker space, and so Starla Gaino worked on writing and reaching out to some other civic organizations in the hope to grow that. So okay. Dr. Adams was able to share the opportunity through the um, National League of Cities of Correspondence, so it was nice to apply and be recognized for what we're doing, plus the you know possibilities of what could come in the future as well. Okay, thanks. Next, we'll move on to the report of the superintendent. Uh, I think it was a, uh, probably very timely to share a little bit of information about um, weather and the effects of that as far as school. Um, we already had two events that end up involving some, some weather that questions uh, whether or not school should be uh, in session. And I, I want to go over a few details so that uh, people are aware because um, Whenever, whenever that does occur, whether it's snow or, um, it's usually snow or, or ice, um, you can have other conditions, I guess, but it's pretty rare that other conditions is going to cancel uh, school. Um, in this particular case, we ended up having um, really a blizzard over the weekend, which is very easy to end up saying when you have a blizzard, well, you shouldn't have school the next, whenever that next day is, you have a blizzard. I assure you, <clears throat> if the blizzard would have come just 10, 12 hours later in our area, we would not, there would have been no consideration of having school. Uh, but when it, when it was over, we had crews uh, on Sunday afternoon out working, uh, cleaning off uh, uh, sidewalks, uh, parking lots. Our problem ends up being that there was a there was a layer of ice that really did form before that, before the snow. And that became probably the bigger issue. Well, no question that was the bigger issue. We also had another problem that occurred, which again, we didn't know of until this, this morning, is that the power outage that occurred over the weekend, um, everything came back on, but one thing that occurred uh, at two of our, well, one of our buildings, the high school in particular, was that the setback was, stuck, let's say it that way. It, it did not kick on as far as it was Monday morning. It stayed on the kickback setting, which was 10, 15 degrees lower than, than basically when school was set. So heat was on, but it was as if it was weekend, and it never did kick into that particular mode. Uh, realizing that and then trying to work on it from, from Rockwell, which we should be able to and was not able to to do that, had to go on site, and it was it was the mid late morning. I mean, before really was able to get that kicked on. Um, for people to say there was no heat, well, that's that's not exactly right. It was in the set, setback mode, but that was because of the electricity going off, uh, which created you know a problem there. Another issue that occurred with uh, heat at um, Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt's heat, they again. The crews came in, they checked things out, the, the boiler was on at Roosevelt. Um, one thing that uh, just was not checked or just m missed was that the pumps weren't on. So the boiler, it was hot, but the pumps weren't running, so therefore there was not heat. And as soon as 
we checked that, got that reset uh, this morning. Uh, Roosevelt heated up as well at that point. So we had a couple buildings that was, was cold because of, because of electricity going out, not because of the, that was the wind that created that problem. <clears throat> but um, I want to share that the decision to end up uh, calling school off becomes a, a decision in which uh, you have transportation director, maintenance director, myself, other superintendents in the area as well communicate. And on Sunday, quite a few people were talking to make that determination. Because it's not <clears throat> always as simple as saying one community, and even if you're only 10 miles away to another community, that both of them should be doing the same thing. 10 miles can be a big difference in the amount of ice or snow or you know what, whatever the conditions are. Another item that's come up as far as questions, which I don't know if Hayes is aware of, but people may be very aware from the standpoint of, okay, why do the schools around us end up having a late start many times of 10 o'clock? Why doesn't Hayes do that? Most of the time, late starts are due to transportation and busing. <clears throat> Hayes is a unique community where the busing um, has a percentage-wise a very small percent of out-of-town um, students. You know, the, just a significant number is in town. And so what affects other communities, I'll give an example of like Chapman. If anybody is familiar with Chapman, Chapman's a little community, tiny but it's a 4A school district. Because it has 500 square miles of basically 60, 70 buses that are involved in picking up kids and bringing them to this site for school. And they end up figuring in, I'll go so far to say eight, 10 uh, snow days within their calendar because of that. If there's ever problems with even rain, you know, they'll have late starts, they'll end up uh, canceling school. Whereas when you end up having communities such as ours where really the large number is in town, it's, it's a different kind of consideration. The other consideration is for Hayes, we don't have eight days for snow days. We have two, and maybe it's two and a half, okay? That's <clears throat> but that's what we're considering. So that's another consideration when you're looking at this. And you can use them. They could have been, could have been used today. But you go past that, there is a point where then you have to pay those back because you have to have so many minutes within the year. And it's very possible, I mean, it happens. There are school districts that then add days to the calendar, which sometimes is at the very end of the year, or it could be at spring break where they have to then go another day or two to add those minutes back. So it's, it, is, it is a thought out process. The issue sometimes I have in, in a place before, uh, called school off because the weather forecast was just, it was, it was gonna be horrible. And the next day for some reason it missed us. And, it, and it's really, that's, that's hard when you have a day that looks like a good day and why did you miss a day? But I've also had a day where you've You've had them come to school and basically um, something came in that was supposed to be a half inch of snow and it was dropping much more than that and you're letting school out at, at noon just because you needed to at that point. So just a little bit of information in case people you know, are aware it's not a matter, actually it's important. I didn't have a single conversation with the board member yesterday you know, this, the, the whole process of that, uh, there's some jokes that go on with uh, district administration. What's the most important job that a, that a superintendent has? That's calling school off, you know, if you have snow days. <clears throat> well, the superintendent in Chapman's well-loved, and the superintendent in other places like Hayes is hated because they don't have that many <laughs> uh, snow days that they work with and call school off. Um, Today you could look at it at noon and say, well, it's a pretty day, boy, it melted. I mean, it looks really, going home wasn't so dangerous, but it was pretty bad this morning. There was a lot of ice. Uh, another question came up about uh, parking lots. We have never budgeted, actually, I don't know a school district that budgets enough um, salt or the um, sand or for the parking lots. They, they're never treated for ice or snow. They're, 
the snow is pushed, and that's as good as it gets. <clears throat> then you hope for sunny weather to melt it, but uh, we, we are not capable, we don't have the funds, actually, and we're not different from other districts of trying to treat parking lots to make them better. We try to treat the, <coughs> the sidewalks and make that better, um, as safe as possible, but we, we try to do as well as we can, and um, uh, there is a lot of thought that goes into it, and mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people that try to make the best decision as to what what you're going, and the best decision, I agree with anybody, best decision is to make it the day before. It's always hard to be waiting until five in the morning, six in the morning, and make a call at that time, but um, I guess I'd open it to questions if any board members have. Um, that was the that was the process, and the other piece is we haven't hit winter yet. Uh, winter is still a month away. I was good with it. I needed my kids to go back today. Well, <laughs> and Amanda, thank you for saying that because a lot of people. I know that people. There are people that the danger, the safety issue. Some people really do need or want their children at home as much as possible. But the fact remains, the majority of families need their kids at school. I mean, that it's the majority do. They go by the calendars that are set. And then those calendars are very important in their lives as far as arranging day-to-day -day activities, what they can do. So. Well, we also respect individual decisions families may have to, oh. to not send them because, you know, we make a call for the general population, but there are people who live in places that it may not be safe. So that's always a call we respect a family decision. And today there was, there was a large number that made that choice. You know, there, that, that just happened. There was a lot of children that didn't come to school because of weather. That's all I have for my report. Okay. All right. Uh, next thing is a financial report. The financial report is um, <clears throat> available to you to look at. I, I, I would say that one of the easiest ways going through October is the way this is set up, we may want to talk about it in the near future, but the percentages is something that's always helped me in trying to determine. Sometimes you'll see a percent that's 90%, but that's intended. You, you pay that out at the front end of the year, but really you go through that and you're really looking at that 30 to 40%, and if they're in that range, we're, we're looking good um, when, you, when you scroll through that. I don't know if there was any questions. I don't think any came to me or to the business office um, this last week or two, but um, anything, any questions that you would have at this point with it? <coughs> Anybody have anything? Okay. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda, uh, which is to include the board meeting minutes from November 12th, 2018, the approval of bills in amount of $349,786.39. Personnel transactions, approval of surplus items, early childhood, child, early childhood connections, director's report, November 26, 2018, early child connections policy council meetings from October 24th, 2018, and that is all. I'll move to accept the consent agenda as presented. A second. Second. Been moved by board member Adams, second by board member O'Borney. All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion passes 6-0. Next, we'll go on to old business, which is to include the superintendent search. And I think we had two firms that gave us a three, two? Three. It was three. three. It was three. One was notably higher, but that one includes out of state. Is that correct, Sarah? Yes. Do you have a question, McPherson and Jacobson? As I was reading through the proposal, it looked like there was the fees, and then there was well, forget the cost, and then the fee, which it's brought them up closer to eight, right. 18, 000, fourteen thousand, eighteen thousand, thirteen three fifty. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere in that ballpark. <laughs> Why is it presented as 
4850. Then. That's what I'm trying to. That's what I'm asking too. I must have missed that one. Putting yeah. a spreadsheet together. Well, I they have they have one place where say here are our fees. Let's say then we have our our Expensive. costs, and then fees. here is the fee that we have on top of that. So it is quite a bit more than what's represented here. If, yeah. Do you know what page that was on? Seventeen. Well, no, twenty-seven of their proposal. Twenty-seven. Seventeen. Of them. No. Twenty-four. Forget seventeen. So it's twenty-seven of the proposal. I don't know where it came up with seventeen. Okay. Yeah. Expenses and fees. That's what I. And so there's the total was yeah the thirteen, three fifty. So that's a correction that table. Um, which makes KSAB the cheapest mm -hmm. or, or least expensive by yeah. far. Yeah. I'm in favor of KSB. I feel like they would care more being a Kansas advocate. Shannon, I really appreciate you putting together that information that we asked for from that last meeting. Um, yeah, I was hoping you all received that. I actually yeah. checked today. There are a few more new postings, so there's actually more vacancies than, um, than there were when I sent that. But I didn't get any other responses. But I thought those who shared were honest and shared what their experiences had been. So. Well, I don't think anyone on there listed KSB <coughs> as a negative. You know, I mean, yeah. they, they did admit, and I think it's already kind of mentioned that, um, some of these others may do a better job of looking outside the state. Um, although, considering the Kansas Association of School Board doesn't do a good job looking outside the state, it starts with the word Kansas. I mean, I, 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 I kind of understand a little bit why they're probably thinking that. Um, I would agree with Sophie. I mean, we've used them before. The only negative I could see to them would be, you know, would we get a, slar a, a slightly larger applicant pool if we went with one of the others? But the cost is going to be double if not more. Um, I definitely don't think that KSB steered us wrong on the last one. So, other than he decided to leave too soon. <laughs> that would be the only negative I'd give them. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that the and maybe I'm wrong, but it, it seems like McPherson does a little bit more. Um, I know they're more expensive, but I also, sometimes the cheapest isn't always the best. And uh, you know, for kind of the head position, it would seem that, you know, I don't want to get carried away with the expenses, but I mean, they're, they, the amount seems minimal in the grand scheme of things. So I would think we would want to consider both. And it does look like McPherson had uh, a number of Letters positions in Kansas and recommendations. Other than a larger applicant pool, do we have an? I mean, can you? Get, I, didn't, I didn't read the whole thing. Can you give me some additional examples that you that you saw there? Just the schools they filled recently. Okay, past experience. Many similar in size to us. I'm honestly just more comfortable using KASB. find the one piece on the McPherson with the, <coughs> the guarantee. It's kind of an interesting offer. They had a guarantee? They're guaranteed that if there's a termination or resignation in the first year, that would move forward to do it again. With just fees without our, the actual cost without the addition of the fees. Well, if it, Lawrence and the parents 
share their experience with me in person if you saw that. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, I don't know, they were overly satisfied. Every time it's different, it looks like their staff needed to be helping with some of the processes with Lauren, and then, of course, Lauren's for the program associates. But that's a big price difference as well. So anyway, it was good to get that feedback. So hopefully you have all that. I think the more important thing is just to make a decision. <laughs> yeah. um, because you can see the number of applicants or superintendents that are looking. Um, many of them are due right here, you know, December, beginning of January, if you extended it. So there's only so big a pool out there. Perhaps. Um, I didn't see any of them in person right now being posted, but that's not to say there aren't any. Well, I guess I can I'll just make a motion so we can move forward. Like, uh, uh, like we don't have a motion in the motion bell, okay? No, we just have to Like to make a motion that we contract with KSB to conduct our superintendent search at the uh, price indicated in the proposal. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there uh, any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 Can we have a show of hands? <laughs> Two, three, four. All those opposed, nay. 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 Motion passes to move forward with KASB 4-2. All right. So with yes, that, I think if we reach out to them, they will get posted. Then there was like a timeline. Do you want, they may ask if they can come in December to work with you. That's probably, I mean, I would assume we'd want to get that going as well. So I'm sure Sarah will reach out to How many them. board meetings do we have in December? Just the one. one. So we probably want to get them here to see what park services we want to use and set some dates. Okay. If he's available or whoever. Good idea. Yes. Okay. All right, good. Make sure we're going to move forward with that. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to new business. Um, <laughs> first item is the Federal Early Head Start uh, Duration Grant. And Donna Hudson Hamilton is here. Good evening. Um, this grant is just the next um, opportunity for funding for uh, more of our slots to go full day. So this would increase another 21 slots and then this funding would be added to our base on a, um, from this time forward. And that's what I have here, right? Don? Yep. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Donna? This is to, again, what? It's not adding more students, it's um, lengthening the time that they can stay, there. it's lengthening their day to full day. Mm -hmm. How many total would that give us? So that would give us, um, out of the Head Start grant, we'll be at 45%, which would be 51, and then we use um, additional funding through the Early Childhood Block Grant for another um, uh, 20. Mm -hmm. What if this is dependent on the new facility? Well, um, without the, the new facility, we could probably manage this, this round of increased funding, but we probably couldn't ma um, manage the next time it comes around. So there's a, there is, um, through Head Start, you know, they're wanting all the center base slots eventually to be full day. So they're, you're getting increments of funding available to you to get this accomplished. And so we would be able to manage this increment, but maybe not the next one. 
And what percentage would we be at full day? 45%. 45. Mm -hmm. In your proposal, you made a case of how this was benefit to parents to work. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's who we. That? That's primarily. Um, so, when families request the full day, some of the things that we look at is if they're working or going to school. Those are given higher priority on the list because many families request full day. So, we look at um, those that are working or going to school or a combination of both. And is there not adequate daycare in the community? No. <laughs> yeah, it's an issue across all ages, really, <laughs> from um, early childhood. Okay. All right. And so if we give it, you said this brings us to 45%, if we're, yep. if we're funded. Um, and this is pretty much, I mean, they, they want you, this is pretty much a mandate they have, so... Once, if you if you enter it correctly, you're probably going to be funded for it. Okay. The the only issue that may be negotiated would be um, any startup costs you put in it. Now, um, I did go ahead and ask for the playgrounds to be moved as part of the startup cost. I don't know that that will happen, but I thought I'll ask. Okay, but that won't. They they have the option to say yes. Well, We'll let you have that part. Ah, come on. Right. Okay. right. With that part. And then when you say there's a, another step up grant to come in six months, a year. You know, I don't know when the next one will come. You know, they had one, it, it completed within five years. Um, that was a couple years ago. They've backed off of that, but um, they're continuing. The expectation is eventually all the um, openings will be full day. Okay. So mm -hmm. the capacity plan that you need spaces to bring us to 100 percent yeah. in whatever time frame we yep. an uncertain time frame mm -hmm. and, and so yeah. donna you have this is for salaries but you programs do write for facilities or space oh, yeah. duration because that's the only way they're going to get to right time right I mean, so yes down the road you could we these funds or that could be part of the application yes. but right now it's really just salaries because yes. you could you have the space available right Okay, just wanted to clarify. And, and because we received that other grant for facilities, they had asked me if I didn't receive it then, I could put it in this grant, but it wasn't necessary. Right. You also said if you received this grant, uh, and, and it wasn't the playground equipment included in that, just the grant mm -hmm. for increasing the numbers, you said that you this, this one you could probably still make happen. Right. With what space? Well, we'll use that one therapy room and um, the half of uh, the room that we right now use for a collaborative room with the special education. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to use a classroom in Munger? Um, I would have to recheck all the numbers. It would be pretty close, but I would add those two spaces. And then I may look at outside our county if any of those have room to go full day. Because uh, eventually, our classrooms out in um, Ellis and Russell will need to look at that consideration as well. Okay. Okay. So what's the total amount of the grants? The total amount of this grants are uh, $324,587. The base part that's going to be added every year is $123,755, and just startup was $200,832. And $185 of that was the playground? Yeah. Or yeah. Only. The movement of it. Now, how much of that is the stuff we just moved to Washington? Mm, all of it. And you expect that there is the demand to move to 100 percent? Yes, eventually, eventually um, you know, that will be the requirement. I don't know how long that will take. Right. That will just be. But there's enough when, community demand to fill. Oh, yeah. That and still leave room for a private yes. daycare provider. Yeah. For those who want to do that. Okay. And the other part, should share is it? Yeah, even though it's not tied to this grant, but compliment your group on the uh, 
your score in the class. Thank you. Thing, which uh, Stein represented the, uh, uh, that we came in the top of a, a rating of the instructional value practice as it go on. Not only the top of our area, but um, above the percentage of the top 10%. We're way out of, I mean, we're, we're really good. That's what it comes to. So, the yeah. chance for you to do something more, I think, will value the community yeah. because of what you already do and the recognition of how good yeah. the operation is here. Thank you. If, if the 185 doesn't get approved for the moving the equipment, is that going to get paid how? Um, that was in part of what was budgeted earlier for movement over there. So that's not a surprise cost for us. Mm -hmm. That was all part of it. Yeah. It was, it was part of that um, yep. $500,000 that would be uh, mm -hmm. given back to the, to the district. And yeah. part of that was, was included in the Mm -hmm. I appreciate your forward thinking by adding that into this, you know, I mean, whether it works or not. I it's worth a try. I believe our packet includes a narrative for this. Mm -hmm. When does this get submitted? What? When is this submitted? Um, it needs to be submitted by December 1st. So we do need that. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Then I'd like to make a motion to approve the federal submission of the federal I. HS Head Start Duration Grant. Second. It's been moved by Board Member Adams, second by Board Member O'Borney. Is there any additional discussion or questions? Why is everything set up for December 17th if we're acting on it tonight? Maybe I'm looking at the wrong stuff here. I was going to say, I don't. I don't know. I don't, where do you see the 17th? I Maybe think. I'm looking at the wrong document. I, I guess my other question is why, why are we just getting it now? Well, typically a lot of these fall under, um, just, we just put them under um, a consent agenda, but with it being an additional um, grant, I just thought I should bring it here for the board. No, that makes sense. Thanks for doing that. I think mm -hmm. it's a good idea. I think the question is usually we have new business and we discuss that, and then the next meeting we move on it or vote on it. Okay. Okay. Well, but motion's on the floor. So. Yeah. Well, I'll speak in favor of voting. I, I speak in favor of voting for this one because it really whether the playground piece comes in and saves us money, that's not really the key. The no. key is the duration. expanding the duration so that we can move to the opportunity for people to have full day care through Head Start, which will help yeah. the parents or this, uh, whatever yeah. the parents may be, whatever, whether it's a full-time job or right. full-time student to move forward. So I see it as even an economic development initiative. We can keep people employed. You do need board approval to submit with the grant, right? I do. Without board approval, I'll just have to send in, ask for extension, and see whether they give it or not. Are there any other questions? Okay. Go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Aye. Motion passes 5-1. Next thing on the agenda is the Oak Park Medical Complex project financing. 
Uh, we did get the information. Uh, Gilmore and Bell ended up assisting us with that of putting the documentation together. Uh, that, that was sent to you so you could review it. It's not something that can actually be acted on. It's for you to look at because um, there has to be has to be a day after uh, the uh, I say decision or the uh, whether or not there was the um, petition that was was put in place, and uh, we did contact. Uh, it was Donna today and found out that no petition was filed, but this cannot act, cannot happen until the day after. So actually today was the day for that petition to be turned in. It was not, but we can't actually sign this until the next day, till tomorrow. So it's more a matter of, uh, of the board um, reviewing it, knowing that uh, it's in place, but uh, it'll have to be a following board meeting because of the time that exists with it. I would say if there's any questions, you can ask them now. I would definitely find them, uh, or, or else in the next in the next week or two, uh, share as well. Anybody have any questions for John on this? I guess one thing is I did like seeing the uh, purchase price put down being less than the uh, valuation that we had done. Yeah. Since that was one of the things we had brought up was were we overpaying, and it turns out we weren't um, by the professional appraiser, like 42,800 less. So. Yeah. I appreciate that since we that was a concern about uh, overpaying the value of the price. He did mention that we have a 500,000 um, return, return donation back to support right. the next phase of operation on this. All right, that was, that was encouraging to see. <laughs> uh, the only thing I wondered about in the contract was um, the inspection of the property. Is that um, but which was in the contracts there that there is something majorly right. wrong that that was on the uh, seller. Right. Okay. Well, we end up and if we're if we're moving to the contracts then as well, the five contracts are are included. There was uh, there were two contracts of the five that was a bit of an issue because of the time the timing. Two of them went back to get date set, uh, rechanged on it, and. Uh, the Davis contract and the um, medical center contract was changed and, and signed so that they're they're in in line with the action that would take place tonight. So those five contracts are in play, and I I know at the last meeting I was informed that there was um, uh, the intent to wait for. A couple of things happened, so this board meeting worked better to then have the approval to um, have have action on signing the contracts. Accept these contracts. Right. And I'll make but There's me, supposed to be yeah. five? There's five. It should be six. I have four. I have four in front of me.
to see the contracts go through mm -hmm. here. So no question. Oh, there's five. Sorry, got okay. too many papers tonight. Cool. And I'll uh, make a motion so we can keep discussing this. Motion to uh, accept the, well, yeah, that's it, just the contracts, right? Mm -hmm. Motion to uh, accept the contracts and sign them as they are provided in the uh, agenda. I'll second that motion. All right, it's been moved and, sorry, Ooh. my mic is really sensitive tonight. It's been moved and seconded. Um, what questions or discussion are there? Why? I have a question. I know it's been brought up. I wasn't at that meeting, but <clears throat> I checked again before the meeting, but the one property is still owned by somebody that we don't have a contract with, according to the county appraiser's website. Are we, how are we going to close by December 31st? Sure. My understanding that piece of property is to, that the person we're going to sign a contract with is closing on that property in June of next year. Well, that, that property is, it's all going to have to close on the same day and time of time, including that property or none of them close. And I guess the other, and, and you're referring to the unit that's owned by Bill Davis, that Bill Davis is contracted with the owner to buy. Yeah, I think he he's going to gonna have to close that first, and then at the same time we'll close on that one and the other four, or it won't happen. Right. What about the Oak Park Condominium Association that owns property of worth about 391000 or at least that's what it's appraised at on the county website that we don't have any contract. I think that's the parking lot and the, re the remaining real estate. Well, I assume we're buying it all. I don't know. That would be a realtor question. But He's here. Yeah. The, owners of the, <clears throat> the owners of those units would be members or owners of that association. So, so as part so of the closing, they would convey all their interest in the common area, so to speak? Does the contract say that, though? Because, I mean, the contract's for the real estate, not for the, the association would be a personal property, wouldn't it? If you were buying the shares or the ownership interests? Well, but the... If we bought the if we bought all five units, then the school district is going to own all the rights to the to the association. So essentially, there would be no more association. The members of the association would be the current unit members of each condominium, and they would. Con have conveyed all that interest to the school district. Do we have a copy of that agreement? It's a public record. The condiment, do we have a copy of it, though? Everybody I understand we can go down and do the register of deeds and search for it. Once the school district buys the property, then we'll just terminate the condominium unit. Or, the, excuse me, the uh, association. Additional questions? Good. 
I notice on this one with the Davis also it says that the buyer, if these contracts do not close on the same date, this contract may be canceled at the option of the buyer and the earnest money is returned. Buyer further agrees to allow seller to rent the property for three months for $500 per month after the closing without any association fees to be paid by the seller. I guess why why is that included on this one? He was um, he's one that still is using that particular area and was asking for more time to be able to vacate it. That was the last contract worked on okay. because of him being of using it at this time, okay. and he still occupies it right now. So effectively, just so I'm clear, the seller would be paying the district That's right. $500 a month. Right. And since we assume the association, they don't want to pay that fee anymore. Okay. That's nice. Of us. I <laughs> that's a pretty cheap price. The rental figure? I was going to say, if you base that on what the, the purchase price is. <coughs> well, I know Lance... Um, sent me an email um, he's traveling and couldn't be here but he did have several concerns and um, did express a um, opposition to moving forward with this in a nutshell I could read you the whole email if you'd like but it's kind of long hold on a second my computer is I don't know what it's doing today And wants to go to sleep and not not be here. <laughs> he keeps reloading things. I know he had concerns about um, the the contract, the Davis contract. He had concerns about. He feels that we're overpaying. Um, based on what the property had been on the market for several years and had no serious inquiries. Um, oh, let's see. Um, he wanted to know some questions about the infrastructure. What shape are the roofs in? Will they need to be replaced? What shape is the HVAC? Uh, how about the parking lot? Um, insurance. Um, He's concerned about the rush in time. Uh, taxes. He kind of, he has quite a long list, so it's, it's a long email. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just sharing that he did express concerns. What about the We haven't seen any sort of numbers as to how the much of a tax hit we will take by no longer getting anything from taxes for this building. Well, I just wondered maybe part of that. See, 2017 there was 47,000. 949 paid in taxes for that property. That was done on the appraisal, which I think also addresses part of what he said. Brought the property value at less than the appraised value and less than what we uh, were all we authorized. I think it was two. How much should we say again? Uh, for the finance that we said we wanted to? Two million. Two million. Two million. Less, not by a lot. He also, his overriding concern is that <clears throat> he uh, doesn't feel that this is the greatest need in the district at this point. And 
um, unsure on moving forward with this when we don't have a long-term plan. So that was his mm. summary. I just wanted to make sure I shared that since he did take the time to send that to me. Probably the cost is in there. I don't think we've addressed what we're going to forego right. to get there. Right. And then, you know, Sophia brought up, I think, at one meeting, or maybe that was just in a discussion I had with her, but I think we talked about it at a previous meeting on the O'Loughlin building, if that, depending on what plan we went with. And I think we even Member Walker addressed that. But we had a plan, and I don't think maybe we have one, but it's we don't. Uh, but if we do, and the, and the Owafley building's not going to be used as an elementary anymore, that building's going to be used for the same thing we're going to buy this building for, and the renovation cost is less than what we have in this building. So. I would, um, I would just share a couple items. One is. Um, we did start talking about this 11 months ago. Okay, so it, um, I know there's been a number of things that's come in place that's kind of set it to the side, but uh, we did start 11 months ago. <coughs> Another item was a matter of the 50 some thousand dollars of tax roll. In all likelihood, that amount of money would not be seen either because whoever is going to buy that facility, there's a good chance that they were not going to be um, paying taxes as well. That's just a matter of possibility. Um, the issue of possibility of uh, projects in the future when you're talking about bonds, we've talked about this throughout the last year of being in control of the people voting for facility changes and they haven't the last couple times. Now I do know the projects were quite large, but the issue is this is a project that would not require an increase in property tax. A good amount of it is actually a grant, federal grant, $1.5 million. We're talking about the possibility <clears throat> of making changes at the front end, and I, whether or not it's uh, the greatest need at the state level, Preschool is being identified as one of the greatest needs. I mean, it's clearly identified by our education commissioner, um, by the state board, um, as far as trying to end up strengthening it and making it as, um, as strong as possible in, in the different communities. So trying to identify our movement on this, we have worked through a lot of things to get to this particular point. Um, I think it is another tell when there's a petition and it never did happen. The public never did go through that process of saying no to a petition, which they could have. So as far as a project that a school district is able to do, um, this one has a, a great effect, a very positive effect in the near future. And I'm going to, with no surprise, I do speak in favor of us moving forward with this. Uh, John's already hit several things. Did is that a bond issue? We did at one point talked about a Laughlin as a possibility, but that's a bond issue. That there's no certainty at all that could happen. We do know, as we heard duration grants first of us step up, that we do have a demand that's clearly articulated that we need to be looking at moving to full day daycare. And it benefits, and it, there is a question is, are all those kids in Head Start uh, that are going to benefit from this program, are they all going to come to 489? Not necessarily. Um, it's a multi-county event. But yet it, it's important that those um, 
those youth that are there and the, the things that we do with uh, the Head Start with the family visits, the home program, it prepares them for kindergarten readiness. And if you have looked at anything that's coming from the state and listened to several times that we've heard from the administration, kindergarten readiness is part of our uh, responsibility is to be sure that we have the programs in place to be sure that as the kids come to school, they succeed. And um, Head Start is one of those places that helps those that need, need it the most. And so I think being put, positioning ourselves to be ready for the future, this is a proactive step. Um, a bond issue is also another way, but maybe that comes that we look at expanding West Side. Those plans could be made out. But this is something we know now. The need is coming. And this duration grant is the first of uh, at least one more step or two steps. And we've known about this for three years. I think as long as I've been on the board, this has been the discussion, what will we do when we have to move to full day Head Start by federal mandate? And this is part of that answer. So this isn't out of the blue. This isn't a new thing. This is a way to move forward on something we've had on our docket for a few years in a way that we can do it. You know, the, the concerns about the roof and things of that nature, are good ones to raise. Although it seems like in the contracts that's a major issue, that goes back onto the seller and may not be part of ours. Because I know that uh, several board members brought up what are the, you know, it's a pig and a poke in a way because we don't know. There could be a problem. And that's a good point. But we do have some protection and coverage um, yet on this. And if things don't look good, then we'll have to walk away if the building is in such a poor shape. The yeah, HVAC is um, a fair question. But that is a requirement within the federal grant that that's what we will pay for. So that, in fact, I think that is the one thing that we must do, and the rest is for the renovation use that we don't use for HVAC. So that is a part of it. It's, it's, to me, it's, uh, there is some risk in any decision we make, but it's not often that you have $1.5 million to help mitigate that risk. And that doesn't come easily, it doesn't come often. And in my, uh, my world, I live by grants. Even though I've gotten about $6 million in grants personally, I can tell you there's another 6 to $12 million that I didn't get over my career uh, at this point. And I stopped writing three years ago, so I know of what I speak. But I, I think this is a great thing for our community and our area. And I think we'd be remiss to not seize the opportunity, even with the inherent risk that could be present. Any more questions, comments, concerns? Well, just looking at the appraisal, uh, Building 3, Unit G, which is the one we've talked about, under contract for two hundred sixty thousand dollars, or sixty nine eighty nine per square foot, of, and we're paying four hundred ten thousand dollars for it. So that's concerning to me. Uh, a couple of the other things that concern me about the appraisal. I'm not sure why. Well, I guess it's. it's the interesting thing to note on these appraisals when you're purchasing property is that the appraisal is sent with an attachment that says, here's what, here's what the number you're trying to hit is. Much unlike when you refinance a house and try and get money, they don't have a number to hit, and so the appraisals generally come back significantly less because they don't have a number they're trying to hit. Um, the other concerning factor is that the comparables are Topeka, Derby, three in Wichita, and one in Lawrence. And I would say that our market is much different in the sense that size-wise we're not even close to any of those. I know there's an offset made, but um, those were anywhere from 15 to 25 percent with no real reason given as to why they picked those numbers for different properties other than I think it kind of came in where it needed to. So I've got concerns about the appraisal. I've got concerns about the overall project. I've mentioned those before. If anybody wants to hear them again, I'll be happy to go back over those. But I think everybody here knows my position on it. Anyone else on this end? 
think I seconded this motion, so I think it's pretty clear I support the move to buy the property. Sign contracts. So I'm a yes vote when we vote. Anyone else? Okay. I will call for the vote and I'm going to ask for a show of hands on this, please. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion passes for two. All right, next we'll have a special education update from Director Chris Hip. Okay, uh, just got a couple of things I want to give a quick, uh, uh, I guess almost mid-year update. It seems crazy to think we're mid-year just getting things up and running and it's time to start looking at plans for next year. Right? But that's, that's kind of the way the world works. Um, one of the things that as I came in was a hot uh, topic of discussion and, and rightfully so, is turnover on the non-certified side. So our para-educator turnover, the, the, the board and the co-op took, uh, I think, strong action last year, given the $2 raise for our para-educators. Uh, through November this year, so we compared vacancies, vacated positions from last year, from last August through November, and I'm happy to say we're about a 4% reduction in open positions. Um, we've been kind of thumbnail assessment, having conversations about I think the candidate pool is pretty good. We're getting, we're getting applications for positions, but we hadn't really had a chance to look at yet is how, how are those folks sticking or to stay in the positions. Um, we've had, like I said, last year, 2000, FY18, so last year through November, we had 13 positions vacated between August and November, and that was out of, so those 13 positions are actual bodies. It gets really hard to do the math on these because when I'm looking at our total numbers, we're talking about FTE, which when we hire someone, we're not hiring full time. We're not hiring for, in, a para, in the para world, special ed world, uh, 1116 hours is full time. We hire for uh, about, uh, uh, right around a thousand hours and so each body isn't necessarily one FTE but it's, it's pretty darn close and so out of the 99 FTE we had last year with 13 positions open was about 13 percent this year out of 108 FTE we've had 10 positions open so only about nine percent when we start looking at things that impact that turnover I think one of them is definitely the raise the two dollar increase in pay uh, a couple of other things that we've started doing that I think have are also impacting that turnover. Um, we started doing bi-weekly screenings. So we've got standing positions posted um, through our applicant portal. And as people apply, we'll bring them in every, every two weeks. We've got a, just a standing date to bring folks in for about 30 minutes. And we not only do kind of a, a first step screening to make sure that we would be interested in moving them on to an uh, interview for open position, but we also talk through the pay, the hours, the, the benefits that are involved, things like that. So some folks will screen themselves out, um, other folks we screen out, but of the about 30 folks that we've had go through um, our, our screening pool, we've ended up hiring eight of them, all eight of them are still in place. So. Um, I think we're, we're maybe hope, work, working through some of the efficiencies that way, making sure that people understand exactly what the role entails and making sure that uh, we want them uh, at least sitting down with our teachers and building administrators interviewing for positions. Future step when we talk about um, the paraeducator position, I know that um, benefits has always been on the, on the uh, top of the list, right, to, to continue the conversation. Just to give a little update, with the $2 raise and then the fact that the cost of benefits didn't go up this year, we have seen an increase in the number of paras that are participating in our benefits package right now. Um, they're eligible, uh, part-time employees are eligible for benefits, they're just not eligible for the, the same level of board contribution that full-time are. And so uh, there's you know the money out of their own pocket to, to buy into the benefits, but I will tell you that 
many of the people we sit down with say, well, that's better than what I'm paying through the exchange right now or through other spots. So it's still, it's still access to good quality benefits at a relatively um, competitive price. So we're, we're at about 38% of our paras right now participate in the health insurance uh, benefits through the district, uh, through the co-op, which in, in uh, annual cost for the co-op, that'll be about 460,000. So that's what we're contributing towards board paid benefit for the 41 paras out of that 108-ish that are uh, participating in benefits. To say we want to give benefits to all the paras right now, that's great to say, and we definitely want to work towards increasing the, the benefits because I think that would also increase the, uh, the persistency or the decrease the turnover. But to carte blanche say, okay, you get access to full-time benefits, that would be about a $1.4 million hit. The co-op can't do that, obviously. Um, and just so everyone's aware of the co-op, when I speak of the co-op, that's the host district, USD 49, but then also Ellis, Victoria, and La Crosse are, are equally funded members of the, the co-op as well. Um, so what we're doing right now is we're continuing to work with the broker and we'll be surveying paras and, and basically taking ideas from broker and, and uh, trying to figure out a way to move forward to increase the access to benefits. Um, but still do it in a way that uh, is beneficial to paras and affordable to the co-op. So that'll be something we'll continue to talk about. Um, really beyond that, just a kind of a general update of where we're at staffing wise. As, a, as I told you, last year at this time we had about 99 FTD and paras. We're up to about 108 right now. Um, two years ago we were at 82. So we've seen an increase in the number of paraprofessionals that we have in the co-op, but we've also seen an increase of kids. So we've gone up about 25 IEPs or 25 uh, kids with exceptionalities over each of the last two years as well. Um, certified staff, we're up a little bit also this year. We were at 70 last year, we're at 72 right now. Um, to put it in perspective, when you go back to FY9, so 2008-2009 school year, we're still below where we were at in staff before the financial hard time, hardest times of the state um, at that point. So uh, creeping back, but seeing the kid numbers increase as well. So um, something we'll keep updating you. We have periodic points in the year where we have to report our staff numbers to KSD because that's how we get paid our interim payments based on special ed headcount. Um, last thing, budget-wise, budget, budget wise, it is maintenance of effort and excess cost at the time of the year. So um, here by the end of the, actually by about the 14th, I think 14th, 15th of December, we've got to submit our maintenance of effort and excess cost report. What those are is we receive a little over 800,000 in federal funds. And in order to continue to get those federal funds to provide services to kids with disabilities, we have to show two different things. The first one is our maintenance of effort. And the feds say, in order to get your federal money, you have to spend at least as much as you did the year before out of local funds, minus a couple of exceptions, like if you lost a bunch of kids or if you had um, really tenured teachers that were getting higher pay, if, you had, if they retire and you replace with lower wages, there's a couple of things that you get a little bit of relief from. But in essence, the feds say, you have to spend as much of your local money next year, you know, this year as you did last year in order to get your federal funds. So that's the excess cost piece. Um, and we'll be, all, all signs are positive, we'll meet our maintenance of effort this year. Then the excess cost is, um, the feds want to look at how much does it cost uh, the actual cost of providing services to elementary kids, for whatever reason they, they cut out high school when it comes to this calculation, but it's how much does it actually cost you to provide services to your elementary population as compared to how much you receive in federal funds, so what percent of the excess cost is covered by the feds. Um, and so you're in the midst of doing that reporting, that, that, in, that involves not only um, the, each district, each member district, so A's, Ellis, Victoria, and La Crosse, all have to go through their budgets and itemize everything that's high school expense versus elementary expense, um, as well as all of the co-op expenses also. 
So, um, a little update on, on where we're at for the co-op. We'll be talking some more. Um, I will tell you that, that even though our FTD is up because those the kid numbers are up, our caseloads continue to be um, higher than what probably we would like. Um, and so as now is the time to, to start having conversations with, with folks about uh, priorities and, and what our, our goals and plans will be for FY20. So any questions or comments regarding the special education club? So have you found the uh, $2 increases helping retain people? I, I think so. I, I think um, I, was, I was a little hesitant to say that until we actually were able to, to put together some numbers through this week's um, uh, personnel transactions and, and we're, it seems to me that the trend is that uh, we're experiencing less turnover this year than we did last year. So. Well, and I heard you say the candidate pool uh, generally speaking I, I feel like the, the candidate pool is is there. It's we're we're getting uh, now that being said, we've had positions that have taken a long time to fill. Um, when I say candidate pool, when I'm talking about the folks that are coming into our screening and sitting down and we're talking to them and um, about what the pay would be and what the position would be, there we're finding some quality candidates there. Hey Chris, you mentioned, I think you mentioned you have 108 FTE this year and Compared to 98 last year, the, yeah, 100, um, yeah, about 108 like this year. We're about 99 last year. What is your um, ideal number? How many folks do you? That's really hard to say. So, um, it, because it varies so much based on the individual students' needs and the, and the programming and scheduling within each building, um, more is not always better. So, I would tell you right now, we're we're pretty judicious, or we try to be about adding positions um, because that means now more supervision for each one of the pairs and more um, planning that they have to do to carry out the services so we, we try to be as judicious as possible so I guess I would I would tell you uh, only a little bit tongue-in-cheek I think the perfect number right now is 107.91 because that's what we have if we have a kid move in tomorrow that has higher needs then it may go up um, if we have a kid move away tomorrow then it may go down okay, okay thanks yep. Anybody else have any more questions for Chris? Thank you. All right. Next item on new business is the 2018-2019 budget review for the proposed wage increases for the certified teachers. I understand at the last meeting there was some questions as far as um, with the work that was done um, with, the, with the mediation and having some decisions made uh, or I say decisions, but uh, movement there. It ended up identifying some of the figures that uh, was given to the board as far as how much money. Um, I say it's odd because I, I, I say freed up because basically it was it's within the budget. It's money that can be used in another way than what was um, um, identified at the, at the beginning when the budget was put together. So... I guess questions of that. Uh, I think the intent was to help with some other decisions within the um, in the agenda. Uh, <coughs> is what the intent was. Anybody have any questions on these numbers? I don't remember who asked for them. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> the next thing on the agenda is the Hayes NEA and Board of Education negoti negotiation ratification. Blah. So my understanding is they they ratified all of the tentative agreements last week, is that correct? Yes. So then we have them in front of us, or I have them in front of me. 
There's one that I do need to clarify when it goes to the, um, the salary and wages one. Uh, I think I, I, reading through that, it was pointed out, need to be uh, clarified just so they understand that, that $200 for each individual in the bargaining unit given to employee as part of insurance savings, that $200 for each, in, in, when we worked through that, it was saying all teachers. I mean, it was every one of the teachers was part of that 200. And uh, I guess you read that, you could read that, and it it's may not be that uh, clear. I want to make sure that that was, that was what was um, bargained, that was what was mediated uh, when we were together. Um, yes, I mean, that's, that's my memory. It goes right. to all teachers, but we wanted to make sure we put in there somewhere that the reason we have that money is because of the savings from it. And, it. and it is there. It says the insurance savings, but it also, uh, when it says for each individual in the bargaining unit, I, I guess that's that's each. That's maybe the word all. Um, we just need to make sure everybody's <coughs> understanding it's every, every one. Was there any other questions as you look through that? I, I did have a couple board members uh, reach out and had a question or two about the, the agreements, the tentative agreements, but I think what's before you was talked out at an earlier point unless something else has been questioned. Does anybody have any questions on these before I sign them? I believe I need a motion to approve it. I'll make a motion to uh, approve the tentative agreements with the Hayes and NEA and ratification. I'll second that. Somebody else wants to. It's been moved by Board Member Adams, second by Board Member Walker. Is there any further discussion or questions? If not, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Motion passes 6-0. Next item is the classified administrative staff wages. At the last uh, meeting as well, there was some information of just trying to have a, a quick wage study comparison. Um, I do believe that there's uh, merit in looking at what was put together in short term, but also feel if there is a desire to get extremely specific, uh, there may be that merit to, to look and, and do a couple months of really getting some uh, some numbers for for next year or and try to uh, funnel it down to particular duties or jobs that exist and make sure that they're as fair as possible but what was put together by uh, some of the staff in the last couple of weeks I think is what was was really kind of asked is to look at that and, and kind of get a comparison of what exists in our district and, and elsewhere um, there, there also was brought up the concern of not just a matter of the beginning uh, pay, the wage, but also a matter of after people have been working for five, ten years, what is that cost uh, at that particular point, too? Uh, are they able to end up uh, uh, increasing their wage very quickly? And the answer to that would be clearly no, they, they don't. Uh, in, in this district, we do not have that kind of setting where uh, they have a, a salary schedule that exists that they, they uh, increase their, their pay simply by the number of years that they are, are present. So that becomes something that I think has the merit of, of looking at and considering in the future. But I think with what is here, um, I think that helps with um, at least some questions that you might have or it may give some answers that you that you are trying to look for in deciding the wage for uh, classified staff. I would make a motion to give classified and administrative staff a 3.7% wage increase and also to either form a committee or to come back to us so that way over the next year we can take a look at those salaries 
not in a rushed manner, but and look at bringing those up to competitive wages in the community. I'll second the motion. The only thing I have against that is oh, we're please. doing exactly what we said in November 1st that we didn't want to do. We're grouping all of our staff together with the same amount and the same, you know, I mean, now we're saying 3.7 for everybody. Um, before it was 4.6. You know, we kind of said on November 1st, and I think Lance was the one that brought it up, I, I would agree with him. I almost think we need to start looking at, at breaking those up separately. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm looking at three groups. I'm looking at administration, I'm looking at our teachers or our certified staff, and then our class staff. They're clearly three different positions, three different types of jobs. And I mean, I mean, we can look at doing that next year again, but we're just putting it off again. Well, but I, th I think you've got more issues than that, though, too, even with your certified staff, because you've got nurses in there with teachers as well. And so, you know, I think I agree that you've got to look at it that way. The problem is, is how are you going to do that tonight? And I don't have a problem putting it off and exploring it now, but I think the problem with that becomes is I don't like that those, idea well, but that's yeah. I'm not a fan of making rush decisions without facts, and to me that's where we should be. And I think once we have the facts, you can you know we did it with the paraprofessionals last year, and we did it with janitors a couple of years ago, and I think it's, it's something that needs to be done district wide that. You know, I, I, don't, I don't think there's time tonight to study it or in the near future without, and then having those people be on hold. Well, I agree with that. I don't want to, I mean, I want to make a decision tonight. I you know, I, agree with you there. I'll just jump in. I, I understand, in spirit, I support your idea. In fact, last time we were here, I tried to move to separate the rates and it, either I made a mess of it or no one agreed with me. But, one. but uh, I think that's important to do Yeah, at some point. I, I need to amend my motion because I think I misspoke. I, I want to amend it to reflect that they will have the 4.6% raise during that period in which they already received it. And then from that period forward will be the 3.7%. But going forward, their, their base pay will be at that 3.7%. But I just want to be clear we're not taking anything back from what was inadvertently given. That was already decided at a previous board meeting, so I don't know that you need to amend your motion to include that, Greg. I don't understand it. Good. He read it. I, and I seconded the original motion. So I accept your opinion. Uh, I'll take that myself. <laughs> <laughs> is everything well, like listed up there? Is that all the classified staff? No. I'm sorry, Sophia. What? Is that all classified staff? When Greg? you say... Or what staff is that? It ends up including the staff that we we end up having um, bus drivers, clerical, nutrition, tech assistants are the ones that would be affected by your decision tonight. The included, uh, there's other classified, but those classified are not really fitting into this because of the paraprofessionals, which is a tremendously large number, and they've been already, they, they did get that $2 that Chris was talking about earlier. So it's this list right here by when we went back on the 4.6 to the 3.7. That was impacted. It was like a, the number was $20,000. The, well, that, the figure that was given would be if this group ended up getting still the 4.6 and then continued that instead of the 3.7, the difference would be 20000 And, and let me, uh, I guess, yeah. kind of clarifying that it, is uh, some of the discussion brought up by Cardinal Shorts that we do have, when is the SIU, that contract goes away? It would go away effective the end of June of 2019. Okay. So it means that we'll be in a different place where we now do have, where does that group fit in? Where do the secretary pool? I, I guess there, there is a reason to not just look at what's fair wage for the community, because that's what would apply more for the uh, 
of the classified, whereas the certified teachers, it's more what's fair wage to be competitive with similar schools to us. So we do have different groups that we need to break out and <coughs> negotiate with. Now my experience at the university is that we we treat the different types of jobs different ways and we have our comparison groups are different to compare like people to like people. So moving forward tonight just to get it done, uh, it's not just to get it done, it's to, to honor the fact that we've given wages and close out this year and start next year. I, I think the big part in my mind is who are the negotiating groups and who will represent the, the classified personnel? Um, or, or do they? Or, or how do we begin to do those? But then what do we use as a basis for decision, even for the teachers? What do we use as a basis in forming a committee to do that? So I do support moving forward tonight and coming back with the idea of the a committee that you mentioned. And I would say no matter what the, the board decides tonight, my concern and some of the conversation that I've had in the last um, six months has been a matter of no matter what is decided as far as what the increase on the wages would be, you're, you're still going to be in the same spot five, ten years from now if you do not have that conversation as to do you consider um, some way in which you are uh, giving a a greater compensation for individuals that are within your district over a 10-year period. Uh, if you have a system where a person who's hired today is getting pretty close to the same amount of money as someone who's been working here for eight years, that can be, is that what you want? Or should that be changed somewhat? Because that's a completely different system than what we're doing at this point of trying to arrange that. Well, I think what we ought to be doing is looking at, on a regular basis, I don't know if that's annual, but at least every couple of years, where do we fall competitively right. in, you know, some of these, like Paul indicated, you're going to look in the community. Uh, it, it, I don't know that, like, for food service, we would compare a community probably instead of going to look at other school districts. Right. Uh, you know, teachers obviously are going to be comparing to other school districts. And, and administrators the same way, but you know, if you take somebody that's making ten dollars an hour, and you take somebody making one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars annually, and you give them all the same percentage raise, the person at the top's raise grows exponentially, and the divide gets bigger. Which the is problem, what we're doing tonight, correct? That well, is what we're what doing I'm tonight. Proposing. The problem with that, though, is 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 what number are you going to do? Well, I mean, and, and are you just pulling numbers out of the air? Is the problem? I, don't I mean, because that's yeah. where you end up. I don't say I don't think you're saying we don't need to do that, but you're saying we need to have the facts to do it. Well, I, I'm saying we don't this year, and I I've, I've never been a fan of percentage raises because when you go to the store and buy a gallon of milk, whether you're making 125 thousand or 10 dollars, the increase is the same for everybody, and so that the percentage doesn't make the difference. But having said that, most employers do percentage-based raises, uh, but Last year, the Paris, we didn't wait until this time of year to address that. We started right away and took care of that. There's nothing to say this has to wait until after contract negotiations next year. I'm just saying that it, it's not something we have the facts to deal with tonight. If we want to give the raise and start looking at those positions we think we're out of whack on starting next meeting or the first meeting in January, I have no objection to that. But I just think that... And, what we ought to do is have a pay range for each position, and people fall within that range. I agree with everything you're saying. I'd feel happier if we were doing 3.7% with admin and returning to the 4.6 with the rest of the classified folks. Just because of how things handled, how things went down. Um, I'm also looking at these entry-level pay, and John kind of alluded to it already, you know, the people, the employees that have come and talked to me that have been here for years are at or around entry-level pay. And so I just, I feel more comfortable with, with those numbers. And so if, you know, when this comes to motion, you know, when we're voting for 3.7% across the board for everyone and I vote against it, I guess I want to make sure it's understood as to why I vote against it so the public reading that in the paper doesn't think I'm just being a jerk. <laughs> I do agree 
that we do need to restructure and redesign the way that we are doing all these wages, percentage wages, whatever. But without even getting data or facts, I can look at those wages up on the board and know that I could not live off of those at all. And so I would actually be in favor of doing a 4.6% raise, raise these numbers. Maybe I would feel the same way about administration. I haven't looked at those wages. But with this and knowing how I just feel about it and knowing the fact that um, we don't want to actually be doing the same percentage across the whole board, I actually would like to do 4.6 for all of them today and then also move forward with restructuring and redesigning how we do it. When you say all of them, do you mean the, the group identified here? I, mean, I think yes. you are, but I, I want to make sure. Mm -hmm. I, I like your idea, but I'm not sure that covers. Whoever would all cover. Well, I think I think your the, the concern on some them. of that too is is how many of those competing wages. I mean, we've got Ellis County is all we really have, uh, one Fort Hayes and one City of Hayes on there, and so the question becomes is, you know, are those accurate? You know, have you looked at anything else? Does that do the others include benefits and things like that? Well, wait, Shanna, the, Ellis County, that means data from Ellis County that you gathered from, like the hospital and places like that. Correct? That was from the workforce link um, that we were given by the Ellis County, um, or Grow Hayes. They gave us a link for the most recent studies, and that data is accurate up to 2017, was what okay. that was pulled. So does that include CAPERS? Does that include uh, health insurance, single plan, is it part, you know, those are, those are all very important factors to consider and we don't have that information and I, I just, I think you're... Well, I think another thing we're missing, and I'm not sure how to articulate this very well, it's a big surprise, is that our, the folks that we hire for the district, do they have to go through a, a more stringent hiring process? check out their background, make sure they're okay to work around kids, whereas possibly working uh, downtown as a food service person at McDonald's, for example, might not. So I wonder if there's not only we're missing the capers aspect, but I think we're also missing that these folks might have higher different qualifications than folks that just get hired downtown. And I don't disagree that there's probably a lot of things we're, that we're thinking about that and we're missing the boat on a bunch of others, which is reasons to get the facts and make an educated decision versus a rush decision based, you know. My hope would be that if, when we have more data that we were giving them, instead of a 46 cent raise, that we're giving them a $2 raise. I hope that the data shows that. That's what my hope is, but I, I agree we can't make that decision without that information. I think we could still do a 4.6 now, knowing that it's only $20,000, and then also looking at it later and seeing that some of these do need the $2 raise. Because I think we could all agree that they still need more money. Even if extra added benefits are added into those numbers, those numbers are still really low. Where do you draw the line is my question. I mean, because I, I, mean, I can look at it and say, I couldn't live on that money, and so then you start saying, well, maybe they need 50000 a year to live off of. And do you get to that number? I mean, that, that's the problem. They're with, not with, near that. I know they're not they're near, not that. near that. <laughs> but, it, but the question becomes, where does that? Where do you set that number at? And you know, it's one thing. You know, we just ran through this at my office. We looked at numbers and said, you know, what is a reasonable amount of money that somebody can you can expect them to stick around and pay them, and they can actually live and comfortable. Well. That's one thing when you're spending your own money, it's another when you're spending the taxpayer's money. And so, I mean, the question is, is do you give, I mean, what, what number are you proposing? I want to throw something out there. Uh, I'd asked back when we were talking about this a while back, about the 4.6 or 0.6, is that there's like 112 people in the group, is that correct? And um, well, or no, not counting administration. If you're talking not about yeah. just just the way, just the uh, the wage folks here, 
And I think when I'd ask that, that um, if we went 4.6, is that for some of the people that, that results in a nine cent per hour increase, um, the maximum was going to be about 23 cents per hour increase that we're talking about. And the median, which I think is the really the relevant one, was only going to be 12 cents per hour. Um, I know it comes to 20,000 overall, but you mentioned living wages, honest wages, that's fine. And I, I agree with everything here is that we're kind of shooting in the dark a little bit. But if I also look at it, if, you know, listening to some of the people who have said, and I remember when we voted in SIU saying, well, you forgot about us who were secretaries and you took care of them, you didn't take care of us. To me, they are classified, to me, work-wise, they're very similar in the expectations of work that you're hourly, you're doing your job. But are we making a difference in life? You know, it may be that it should be more per person, but if we go 4.6, again, based on some numbers, minimum is nine cents per hour, max is 23, 23 cents per hour, 12 cents per hour is the median range across there. Because there's some people making less than 10,000. Um, there's a, and I think the maximum range was 45,000. The median salary is only $18,000 that we're looking at. And I know what that was like growing up. My mom made $8,000 and had three sons. It was kind of tight at times. And I don't think 18,000 is much better than 8,000 in the 70s. I'm dating myself. So, I mean, Yes, move forward. If there were debate, I don't think the question is about giving an increase. It's on the 4.6 or the what we do. So about 3.7. And I believe there's a motion out there on the 3.7 for administrators and classified. Although then we've got that. If this one goes down, then there's a counter motion of separating out administrators from the classified. And that those uh, medians and hourly increase was uh, cents on the cents on the dollar was for the classified only. It does not include administrators. Whichever way this vote goes, I think we really need to make a commitment as a board to actually do all the things we just talked about. I'd hate to say, well, we talked about doing a study and we're going to look at these things, and then next thing you know, a year rolls by and we haven't done anything. That's going to be very bad if we do that, and terrible for morale, because people out there listening to us saying, well, gee, 12 cents an hour doesn't sound like much to you guys, but it could be helpful for me. And I agree with Greg, that's why we have to wait any time period on that. And we, so if we January. actually are serious about it, we should, whatever, however we vote, and I'm not sure what, I'm not making a motion, we just got to make sure we do something in the next few months, at least do some research so that we can then make a... Uh, increase the pay like we did with the uh, para uh, professionals. Based on market driven yeah. forces, which is what Another the decision yeah. was, was market driven. Right, right, right. It wasn't just two dollars more, it's two dollars more because we've got a problem we need to solve. So, right now, the current motion on the floor, and Greg, you can correct me if I say something wrong here, is to um, grant the 3.7 percent increase for administrative and classified staff um, from at the last point that we were where they we had to stop the the, the increases um, and form a committee that uh, researches this um, competitive wage and maybe restructure um, salary ranges or pay scale ranges so I'm going to go ahead and call for the vote. We didn't have a second. We need a second. Oh, I thought. Paul. 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 Yeah. I didn't hear you, Paul. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead and call for the vote. All those in favor of this, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. 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 Motion fails. One, five. Luke, yeah, you talk loud. <laughs> well, and, and like I said, we can break it up into two, but I would make a motion that we would increase the admin staff with a 3.7% raise and increase the classified staff back to that 46 And I'm just going to say, you know, I know, I think there was some, John, maybe you, I, mean, I just want to make sure we get, catch all the, the proper classified staff that were affected by that. Right. Um, back to the 4.6%. Yeah. 
Could you add, uh, sorry, you finished your motion, but I was going to say, don't forget what Greg put in there about a committee. Oh, and, and I, would, I would definitely agree with everything that Greg mentioned as far as a committee. Uh, I, if we wanted to give it a timeline, somewhere in my mind, I'm thinking maybe even start that in January. But I, I agree with what Greg said and with what um, Mike said that, you know, I mean, more research needs to be done so we can make a very educated decision on this. I just feel that today, um, this is a good start. So. I'll second. It's been moved by Board Member O'Borney, second by Board Member uh, Young. Is there any additional discussion at this point? My question, if you're going to move them to classify to 4.6, what did the administration do wrong that they wouldn't get the same? What did the teachers do wrong that we only did 3.7 for them? Well, I don't know. You voted in favor of it, so. Well, I did, but I, that's that's why I'm that's what that's where my number is coming up with. I don't think it's fair to put admin at. You, know, you talk about the percents, and I agree completely. I don't think it's fair to put admin at 4.6 if we did 3.7 for the teachers. So. And that's kind of, and I, I need to be really careful how I always say that because I don't want any of these groups to feel that I don't appreciate them or that they are distinctively paid differently. Um, but there's reasons for that, too. They are and there's education levels and qualifications that people must meet. And, I mean, that, and that's as... as good or bad as it is, that's the justification for it. So, And if I did make someone upset, they can reach out to me in email. I do think that it'd be good to make sure there was discussion or clarification uh, with the teachers. There was that $200 linked to the insurance. Mm -hmm. Not saying that that has to be part of this at all, but I don't want the motion to happen and then there's a discussion at a later point of what about that. If it's intended that that's just for the teachers, fine. But if there was any thought at all that uh, that should be or considered in any way as you're working on this, I think it needs to be it needs to be discussed. And the discussion can be, no, we're not we're not <laughs> we're not in, uh, considering it. But it, at least it should be um, addressed. So, do you have any idea what that would look like numbers-wise as far as a cost or an expense to us? Yeah. To do what? To do. Two hundred dollars for well, one time. The $200. problem with that is, is you, that amount of money you saved on the insurance was two hundred and forty dollars total, mm -hmm. and you've given almost all of it away. And understand, I'm bringing this up not in um, recommending that. I'm just saying clearly, I don't want this brought up as a question tomorrow by a few board members or. It, it needs to be addressed now. That makes sense. Well, that could be a separate motion. I mean, that could be after this, since there's something on that we would need clarification. All right, so the current motion by Board Member O'Borney is to increase the administrative staff to 3.7 and the classified staff to 4.6. It's been, has it been seconded? Yes. Seconded by Sophia. All those in favor? Or is there any additional discussion? All those in favor, aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. Nay. Motion passes, 5-1. Is there any additional, additional discussion, motions, thoughts on this topic? Well, because it was brought up, uh, the $200, I, I, I guess we, if it's going to be something you think will come back around to you, which it might. <laughs> no, I, I just, I've not had anybody necessarily I'm not fearful of that necessarily. I just know that it was an issue in negotiations with teachers, and therefore, is it possible questions could come at a later point as to where does that lie? Well, and part of this could be a matter of saying the teachers was 3.7 and the 200. In this case, it's 4.6 for the classified and 200 is not considered. I mean, you could you could rationalize it that way. And actually, that is how in my mind I have rationalized okay. it. Is that you get the benefit, which for for the uh, if you want to look at it that way for the classified, again twelve cents, twenty two cents, twenty three cents, 
cents on the hours if you work those hours. Because it's not a change, I mean, you don't work, you don't get paid, you don't get that income. <coughs> Unlike, you know, well, teachers too have to work, but it's contracted, so they have benefits. So I think that's rest of, I mean, in terms of reciprocity, but I think because it's based on an hourly wage, that's probably a fair basis that I, I would separate it. Um, the question comes with the administrative side of that, with the 200. I, I would have to go back and uh, agree with some of the other comments board members made as far as we have, um, we have had a very unique um, district of having two different negotiations that exist, one for custodial maintenance and one for teachers. Um, that will not exist after this year. There'll be just one. And uh, in that process, I would say most districts that I have worked with typically end up having benefits of looking at classified and certified. And administration usually is tied with certified. I mean, it's not always, but most of the time. And there has to be that, that check um, that constant study, whatever the number of years, two years, three years, four, whatever number of years to, ch to check and make sure there is fairness that exists for classified because sometimes uh, there can be um, oversight that really becomes problematic. I would say an example would be problematic when you have two years ago looking at um, bus drivers and you have bus drivers that's been driving for the district for 15 years and they're paid $10.50 an hour. And in a comparison across the area of 20 different school districts, you have a range of $20 to $10 and we're at the bottom. And that is why $4 was added on without really flinching because we still weren't even, you know, $4 didn't put us even at that close to midway, but, um, I think that's just part of the process. So I think what's been talked about is, is very necessary. I, with administration, administration's always going to be viewed a bit different. And, and I think that has to be accepted to some degree. So okay. that's, that's just the way it is. So that discussion's now. <laughs> well, that's that, sure, that sure your discussion. Well, I think, yeah. yes, I think the 200 for that, I think we given where we need to, which is the bulk of the people who are 100% off. Because I hadn't used it. Um, the only thing I would ask, as this comes out of the motion that um, former Schwartz put in, is um, putting in either for us to discuss or a proposal for administration, what a committee may look like, uh, structure-wise, of, of looking at equitable salaries, and, and I think distinguish, but I think it's also with the teachers as well, um, to be sure that when we come to negotiations that we're agreeing to agree on the base that we will begin the discussion from. Okay, I would agree with the committee that's, uh, I think it's both classified. Too. With classified of trying to put that work together and identify a committee that's going to be simply recommendate that's no power committee that is not a power committee in any way because they're not negotiating they would just gather information and share it with the board as far as what they found that's what it would be if you're talking about another committee for teachers then i'm saying no because that committee is the negotiating group if anything it's just a matter that they need to be working on that from this point till we start our negotiations and this should be our focal point of looking at salary schedule, comparing other school districts, the starting wage uh, or starting salary median, you know, uh, just looking at all the different pieces there, that should be done, but it's not going to be a different committee. Okay. All right. So I'm asking, come forward. Okay. For the bit. I, although, no, it's Okay. Is there any other discussion items or agenda requests? 
I do have one. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd like to, and I don't know the, the best way to handle this, but it came up during negotiations. Um, the NEA contract, um, I'd like to reach out to the uh, NEA representatives or have the, somebody from administration reach out to them <coughs> with the idea of forming a committee, which I would imagine would be their negotiating team or, or whoever they delegate and some members of administration, potentially Bill Jeter, to review the entire contract, take a look at any and all things that are in there that are no longer relevant, and then just to set up the contract in a format in which it's all consistent. Uh, you know, if you look at one section, it's maybe letters, the next is numbered, and it just, it's a, it's a document that's been modified way too many times, and. I'm not suggesting to change anything, uh, even if we don't remove any of the sections, but just to set it up in a format that if you turned it in for a grade in high school, you'd actually get a good grade on it versus a failing grade. So. <laughs> okay. We'll do. Anyone have anything else? Did the committee to restructure and research the pay stuff? Did that get? He's got it wrote down that he's going to. That will be done. Can we, uh, on that deal with the NEA, can we get the report by his next meeting? Just to oh, just sure. Uh, it could be a superintendent's report. Just yeah. I, I, don't, I don't expect any issues with that. It's more a matter of trying to have what you described it as streamline it and make it as clean as possible and easy to read. And yes. And, and identify a single editor? Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, I mean, well, well it's going to take a committee, but one person. Can edit that changes either side. I don't care. Okay. But the editing committee cares. Anyone have anything else? I don't believe we need an executive session. All right. Meetings adjourned. <laughs>